Amen. Thank you, Brother Dalton, for singing that this morning. Great song, great message from that song. If you have your Bibles, please open to the book of Psalms in the 34th Psalm, Psalm 34. One of, if not my favorite psalm in all of Scripture, Psalm 34. This morning, with the Lord's help, we'll look at Psalm 34. And I'd like you, once you find Psalm 34, if you do me a favor, to stick your finger there and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 21. If you have a phone, then don't worry about sticking your finger there. It'll be just fine. If you have your Bible, then stick your finger there and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 21. This morning, with the Lord's help, I want to look at this idea of being lost. There's a couple different avenues that we can get lost in our life. There's one way that we can get lost physically. You're lost. You're in a location that you don't recognize without a way of finding a way out. Now, with the advent of GPS and smartphones, it is a lot less likely nowadays for people to get lost than it was before. But it still happens. Maybe you've been on the water or in the woods where you don't have great cell phone service and you have no idea which way is north, which way is back to land. You are effectively lost. We joke, and men, we know this, that men are never lost. We may take the long route. We may go on a boat around all of Asia, but we're not lost. It's the scenic tour. You're welcome for helping us let you make memories with us. And women you're more ready and willing to admit that you're lost at times. We get lost physically, but that's not what I want to look at this morning. If you don't know where you're at, you're at First Baptist Church. We can help you. You can also be lost in a spiritual sense as far as lost and not on your way to heaven. We'll look at that a little bit later in the service, but it's possible for someone, the Bible says, to be lost needing salvation. I'm sorry, needing salvation. They're lost. Jesus refers to the lost sheep, someone who's never trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior. But even that is not what I want to look at this morning. There's one more place we can be lost, and that is also in a mental, physical, and spiritual position, where we are in a state, in a, maybe a set of circumstances, where we don't feel like we know which way is up where we operate and we're going through the motions, we're making decisions and living our life, but boy, life seems a little bit out of control. Have you ever felt like life is a little bit out of control? Welcome to 2020. There are so many jokes about 2020, and I do not want to downplay what's going on, but it has seemed like our lives have been turned on end and upside down. Not through our own choices, necessarily. Not through our own decisions not because of things that necessarily we have done but we if we're not careful can become lost psalm 34 a tremendous passage a tremendous psalm with your finger there don't turn there yet just hold it there david begins psalm 34 this way i will bless the lord at all times his praise shall continually be in my mouth my soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked unto him and were lightened. And their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried. And the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The psalm goes on to talk about what and, and how God works. Part of the psalm, David will say, seemingly to a group of younger people, or he says, um, Come ye children, hearken unto me, and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. David then in Psalm 34 begins to explain what the fear of the Lord looks like. What man is he that desireth life and loveth many days that he may seek good? Keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. This psalm, a powerful psalm, a comforting psalm. But this morning I want to look at the background of the psalm and where and how it was written in the, the place that David was at and I think it'll be a help to us today. 
We can read the book of Psalms and we at times say, wow, what an amazing belief, what an amazing strength. Boy, what fortitude, what spirituality. I wish I had that. But then we think to ourselves, well, I'm no David. And that's true. We're not. We're not. But you know that David wasn't always making right decisions? You know that? Sometimes David made some bad decisions, some poor decisions. I'm glad, the, I'm glad the Bible includes the poor decisions. You want to know why? I can relate to poor decisions. And I think you can relate to them as well. In fact, our minds often go to our poor decisions more than our good decisions. We can feel like we're one step away from disaster. And we'll look at this morning, if we can, in 1 Samuel chapter number 21, the background of this psalm. And I think the Lord will give us some help in case we feel lost today. Look in 1 Samuel 21, beginning in verse number 10. And David arose and fled that day for fear of Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. The servants of Achish said unto him, Is not this David the king of the land? Did they not sing one to another of him in dances, saying, Saul hath slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands? And David laid up these words in his heart, and was sore afraid of Achish the king of Gath. David, who had slain Goliath. David, anointed to be king. In fact, the servants here said, Is this not David, the king of the land? David was not the king yet, but this is why Saul wanted to kill him. So he had not been crowned and declared king yet, but in God's economy, he had already been anointed king. And apparently, Gath, at Gath, they knew about this. They said, is not this David the king, or in essence saying, the future king. This is the guy going to be in charge, and he has slain his tens of thousands. He is a warrior. He is mighty. Uh, king Achish, you need to fear because David just showed up. Yet, David, the Bible says, verse 12, laid up these words in his heart. You ever get in a place where you begin to lay up things in your heart? There's a burden, there's a concern, there's some words that are said, and you begin to lay them up in your heart, or you begin to dwell on them. Oh, yeah. I'm in a bad place. They know who I am. They've known that I've killed other men. I, I, I'm, I'm not among friends, I'm among enemies. And David began to lay up these words in his heart. And notice what the Bible says in verse 12 happened. Because he did that, he was sore afraid. Remember, we talked about the shepherds this morning. They were also sore afraid. But for two entirely different reasons. The shepherds were sore afraid because an actual angel showed up. If an angel shows up in the sky, you and I would also be sore afraid. David was so afraid because he began to dwell and think on some things that weren't right. It caused him to have great fear, so much so in verse number 13. And he changed, as David changed his behavior before them. And he feigned himself mad in their hands. He pretended to be insane. He pretended to be nuts. Why else would David, the future king of the land, why else would he show up into enemy territory? He must be wacko. He's lost his marbles. He's not operating on, on everything. He's one fry short of a happy meal. He scrabbled on the doors of the gate. He spit on the doors like a crazy man and let his spittle fall down upon his beard. David put on... He put on the acting of the century right then. David convinced these enemies that he was plumb nuts. David was so afraid, he began to operate in his flesh, began to solve his problems, and his, and his decisions were made based on his fear. And because of that, he said, uh-oh, I've got to get out of the situation. The only way I know how to is to act like I'm nuts. David is now, I would say, in a lost place. Not lost because he's not going to heaven, but lost because he's lost his way. 
He's lost some things at this point. You see, David was in a bad position. He was hunted by Saul. He was haunted by his fears and harassed by his enemies. But David made some bad decisions. He ran in fear. He reacted in fear. And, and David lost some things. First, he got lost physically. You notice back in verse number 10, the Bible says David arose and fled. He, he lost his place. David was in the palace uh, eating with Saul and the king and among the princes and the other men and women in the palace. He lost his place. He lost his protection. And he lost his privilege. David it became so fearful that he ran. He first of all began with fear of Saul, fear of man. He began to run and he lost his place. He lost where he was at. He pulled himself out of the place that he should have been. God never told him to leave, but, but God said, you are going to be king. Now, we understand this. We understand that if someone's trying to kill you, that you would become afraid. I get that. Do you get that? Yes, none of us would, would in a sense, judge him for the thought of, uh-oh, someone's trying to take his life. This is not a good situation. But David didn't put himself here. God had put him here, right? David did not crown himself to be king. God had him anointed to be king. God had put him in the palace. God had done these things, and because of his fear, David ran and lost, got lost physically. David, I noticed in this passage, got lost mentally. He became so enraptured by his fear. He became so consumed with his fear that the only way he thought he could get out is to act like he was just nuts. I've had the privilege of doing a number of different things in plays here at First Baptist Church. I accused the former assistant pastor years ago of never getting to do dress up growing up, so he made me dress up. And I have been a number of different things. I enjoy that. I enjoy adopting him, trying to figure out a different accent or different personality. I've for a number of years directed the Patch the Pirate place here and have enjoyed helping the young people find a character inside them. All right, and begin to plan out that character. And I'll ask them questions like, okay, this character, what do they eat? What do they like? How do they walk? What do they think about? What are their hobbies? Things that never you ever see on stage, but in the background you begin to adopt this, this persona. And David here, because he was so mentally out of shape, so mentally lost, and because he was so afraid, said the only way out is to act like I'm nuts. And he had the performance of the, of the decade, of the century, of the millennia. And it worked. It worked. David reacted in his fear, and it worked. Look at verse number 15 of 1 Samuel 21. Have I of need of madmen that ye have brought this fellow to play the madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? In chapter 22, verse number 1, David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave of Adullam. And when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down thither to him. You see, David got lost physically. He had left, he, he lost it mentally. Boy, he's in a bad place. He's not making good decisions. He saw this problem, and it worked. Listen, my friend, there are times in your and I lives that the decisions we make will actually work. They'll actually work. We can react and walk in fear, and we can react in these ways and say, you know what? I have a plan. Here's my plan, and it not be a spiritual plan. David was not acting spiritually at this moment. David should not have fled down to Gath to God's enemies. But it worked. It worked. Problem solved. End of issue. David is no longer in the presence of his enemies. And it's a, it's a, it is a dangerous place, a scary place, when God allows our solutions to work. When God allows the things that he wants, uh oh, I've got a big bill and I can get overtime. But I've got church. You know what? Problem solved. Problem solved. I'm in this relationship and it won't work, and so the only answer is a divorce. I don't need that stress in my life. Problem solved. Problem solved. Years ago, we had a, we've had some young people who thought the only way to get ahead in their life is to run away from home. 
And it worked. It worked. The stress that they faced here was no longer there. But the fact is, it doesn't ultimately work. David had instant success. He had a little bit of solution to the problem. But David's in a bad place. He got lost physically. He got lost mentally. But he also got lost spiritually. When David's in this cave in chapter 22, we find that's where he pens the words to Psalm 34. And I see in this cave that God begins to bring David back to himself. David lost three things that I think affected his walk with God affected his life. He lost his focus, he lost his faith, and he lost his fervor. And in that time, you can look at 1 Samuel chapter 21 and 22, and you can see where David lost his focus. You can see where David lost his faith and where David's, David lost his fervor. But we look at Psalm 34. Now, if you would, please turn to Psalm 34. Flip back there. And you see a refreshing place where David turned back to. In Psalm chapter number 34, written in the cave after David fled from Achish the king. A place where David was not at first in a great place. You'll see maybe in your Bible where it says the Psalm of David when he changed his behavior before Abimelech who drove him away and he departed. The Psalm of David. I'd like to look at Psalm 34 this morning, and I'd like to help us come back to God. In a time when we may feel like we're lost, where maybe our solutions appear to be working for a little time, I want us to turn to Psalm and look at Psalm 34 on the light of, is God trying to bring us back to Him? Lord, help us this morning as we look at Your Word. Lord, help us to find how we can find You. Lord, help us to refocus, recommit, and have a re reignited passion for you. Lord, help us through the decisions of Paul and the life of, I'm sorry, of David. Lord, help us to have those things touch our heart this morning. Lord, help us to see where we've shifted, where we've operated in our fear, now to see failure. Lord, may our hearts be touched by your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be in a bad situation. You may feel lost. But Psalm 34 helps us in three ways to come back to the Lord. The first thing I want to look at this morning is the focus. David, first of all, had a focus problem. Look at Psalm 34, if you would, please, where now David shows his recommitment to his focus. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. You see, David had a focus problem. If you were to go back you don't have to to 1 Samuel chapter 21 you'll see that first of all David began to focus on a person that is Saul being to focus just right there anytime that we focus down here we lose this focus right here because of that shift in focus David then began to focus on his problems and it was a problem the king of the land was trying to kill him but David's problem wasn't Saul David's problem was his focus you want your problem to be what's around you. Don't you know, Pastor, this whole pandemic has destroyed, has destroyed my career. Your problem is not here. Your problem is right here. And David brings us back, brings back the focus to God. I wonder this morning if your life has a problem with your God focus. I wonder if this morning your life has a me focus. Boy, it's easy to be me focus. We struggle with me focus all day long. You sit in church, your stomach rumbles and grumbles, and all of a sudden, you have a me focus. Oh boy, I'm starving now. Why is it I can, get, I can be fine but sit down for church and I get hungry? I get hungry sitting up here before I preach. You have to put out the me focus. Boy, a little bit of pain. The other day I had a little problem on me, and I, I couldn't think of anything else. If something hurts, it, like it just reverberates in your head. We have a problem with a me focus. Anytime we have a me focus, guess what we don't have? A God focus. David had a me focus. Well, we understand it. He was trying to be killed. But because of that me focus, 
He made bad decisions, poor choices, walked in fear. Psalm chapter 34, David refocuses back on God. I will bless the Lord at all times. Now think about this. Saul was still hunting David. Saul was still there. This is right after that happened. His problem had not gone away, but his focus had changed. The person was still after him, but his focus had changed. He was still, the Bible tells us, will still be hunted for a long while. But David says, you know what? I will bless the Lord at all times. Lord, thank you. Thank you for what you did today. Thank you for what you did yesterday. David had a shift in his focus. You see, when our focus gets off, all right, from here, we make bad choices here. Why is your life a wreck? Because possibly your focus has shifted down here. And you respond in fear, you will reap failure. We become so consumed by what is around us that we have forgotten the God who surrounds us. We have a focus problem. We can have a me focus, we can have a career focus, we can have a problem focus. But ultimately, it's a God focus. You know, David, in these, these first few verses, says three things. He says, I will bless the Lord at all times. A God focus says, I will bow to his will. That word bless means I will kneel to God. I will bless. Lord, whatever you want, your way. Lord, if you want me to be hunted, I'll bless you for it. I kneel to that. I accept it. I, I, I crave it. David, when he says that, that shift of focus, he says, Lord, what you brought to me, I'm okay with. Oh, man, That's, that is easier said than done. Oh, man, uh, I don't know about you. Easier said than done. God, what you brought, I accept. I bow to you. I bow to your will, even when it doesn't make sense. Lord, I, you anointed me to be king. Excellent. So now I'll take some king classes. I'll follow Saul, we'll have a smooth transition. And God says, nope, the transition will be you're going to learn while you run. Lord, I don't like that class. I'm going to, with all respect, withdraw. But that's what David did, wasn't it? He fled. He withdrew. David here says, Lord, put me back in. Whatever you want, I bow to your will. See, a God focus says, Lord, I bow to your, to your will. A God focus says, I will praise your works. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. Lord, what you've done is good. <laughs> but David, you're in a cave. Last week, you were in the palace. David, you're barely scraping by for food. Last week, the food was served to you. David, last week you had your pick of any of the soldiers you wanted and anything you wanted to do. This week, who's coming to you to help you? The poor and desolate, so First Samuel 22 tells us. All those who owed money came and helped David. David, your fighting force before consisted of the finest trained soldiers in all the land, and now it's a bunch of deadbeat debtors. And David says, my soul shall make her boast in the Lord. Lord, what you brought me is really, really good. Not only do I accept it, I'm thankful for it. Lord, not only do I say, okay, I'm okay with it, but Lord, I'm excited about it. Lord, thank you for what you brought to me. Lord, the vehicle you gave me, it's wonderful. It's even broken down. Mine's not, but it's broken down today. Lord, thank you. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. You see how David shift his focus? Boy, he was scared out of his mind, but now he's thanking God. I bow to his will. I praise his works. I'm not complaining. I'm praising. I miss no opportunity to, to exalt the one who saved me, the one who keeps me, the God who loves me, the Savior who died for me, the Holy Spirit who guides me. I'm on the inside and the outside, an ambassador for the goodness of God. You know, having a good spirit is not just about putting on an act. It's about letting what's truly inside comes out, come out. You know why you complain all the time? Because inside you're a complainer. 
You know why you're grumbling and, and griping about things? Because inside, you're a grumbler and a griper. And inside, inside, you're not focused on him. When my soul inside makes her boast in the Lord, that can't help but come out. Or are you just naturally optimistic? No, I have to choose to be optimistic in God. You just choose to be a grouch in yourself. David says, my soul will make her boast in the Lord. When you have a focus on God, you bow to his will. You praise his works, but you promote his way. Look at verse number three. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I see David now, he's gone from acting like a madman and being scared to saying, listen, I want others to do the same thing. I'm encouraging others to walk with me in this walk for God. I'm seeking others to walk the path with me. I'm trying to further the kingdom of God. I'm inviting folks to be a Christian. I want them to come to church. I want them to hear what God has done. I'm promoting his way. I want to be the best salesman for God that I can be. Boy, used car salesmen, they get a bad rap, don't they? Right? The rap is they'll tell you anything you want to hear. It's not always true. You can find some honest ones. And Brother Robinson, he's an honest one. I like him. All right? But some of them get a bad rap, but on purpose. But you ought to be a salesman for Jesus Christ. Do you like being a Christian? You better believe it. Is it good to serve God? Oh, let me tell you the ways it's good, and I'll keep you occupied the rest of the day. Do you like going to that church, First Baptist Church? Well, it's really good. The pastor, he's a moron, but everyone else is really good. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Brother Kemp. We'll see you at the altar in a few minutes. <laughs> Someone whose focus shifts on God bows to his will, accepts, praises his works, but promotes his way. Do your neighbors know that you love to serve God? Does your family know that you enjoy what God has done? Promote his way. Do your coworkers know that you're a Christian and not just a closed, quiet, mealy mouth Christian, but you're a vocal, praise God Christian? I'll promote his way. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. I am praying for, speaking about, encouraging, inviting coworkers, unsafe family members, neighbors, anyone that I know that doesn't have God in their life to bring them to God. You see, the temptation always exists to focus on the wrong things, to forget where you're at, to stretch or compromise. It's so easy to be distracted by the numbers by the problems. There's so many gimmicks that will take us away and lure us away from our focus on God. We're the target. But my friend, don't lose your primary focus. Keep the main thing the main thing. See, I see a focus with David. Then I see faith with David. Look in verse number four. David's focus shifts, but now his faith shifts. Back in 1 Samuel, David was solving his own problems. Back in, in there, David was solving his own situation. But in verse number four, David says this, I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my, what's the next word? Fears. Who did David fear? He feared Saul. He feared Achish the king. He feared dying. He feared all these things. And David here, though, in Psalm 34 says this, listen. I sought the Lord, he heard me, and he delivered me from all my fears. David's faith was restored back to God. He was solving his own problems. Now David says, listen, uh, God will solve my problems. That's verse number six. This poor man cried, I'm a nobody, he's a somebody. And the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. Here in verse number six, David's not saying, listen, I made this work. He's saying, listen, God will solve my problems, not me. I don't want to solve my own. I'll let God solve my problems. Verse number seven, the angel of the Lord encabled round about them that fear him and delivereth them. I wonder if your life, if your life shows your faith in God. Or does your life show your faith in yourself? I've got this bill, I've got this solution. I've got this problem, I've got this solution. Men, if we're honest, we usually try to solve our own problems. And usually it's with this mind and these two hands. And I'm as guilty as everyone else. There's a problem, I am tempted to solve it with me. It seems that after I make a mess of it, right, then I'm driven back to the Lord. 
But I got a problem. I'm tempted to solve it myself. I can identify with David. But here, David says, I got my focus back, but I see I got my faith back. The angel of the Lord, he encamped around about me. He'll deliver me from all my problems. David was ruled by his fear, not by his faith. David operated by his earthly sight, not his spiritual sight. But here in Psalm 34, his faith is restored in his God. You see, this, as the song says, faith sees the invisible. Faith believes the incredible and receives the impossible. Faith is deaf to doubts. Faith is dumb to discouragement. Faith is blind to impossibilities. Faith knows nothing but success. Faith lifts up its hand through the threatening clouds and lays hold on him who saved him. That's faith. And that's what faith does. Faith makes the outlook look good. The outlook look bright. The inlook look favorable. And the future look glorious. That's what faith does. David says, boy, God hears me. This poor man cried. My faith tells me that every time I cry out to God, he hears me. Not only will he hear me, he can deliver me. Twice in this passage, David will say that he'll deliver him from many problems and all his problems. Beginning in the middle and the end of the chapter, Psalm 34. You see, God's there to help us. He's able to help us. And faith says that he will help us. Sometimes it's problems that I create. That was David right here. Sometimes problems I, I, I'm caught. That's David right here. Caught with Saul. Created when he fled. God still helped him. Someone said this in the Westminster Abbey. There's inscribed on a monument this phrase. He feared man so little because he feared God so much. Faith in God. A, little mother, a mother and her little four-year-old girl were preparing to retire for the night. The child was afraid of the dark, as many children are. As her mother put her child to bed, the daughter asked, The moon, is that God's nightlight? And the mother said, Yes, dear, God's light. She said, Will it ever go out? And the mother said, No, God will never blow out his light. It'll be okay. The daughter said this, well, so long as God is awake, I won't be afraid tonight. You know what? God never sleeps. And as long as God is awake, my faith can have a foundation in him. I see the focus, I see the faith, but lastly, I see this, the fervor for God. Look with me lastly in Psalm 34, verse number 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. David was called a man after God's own heart. David, a man who loved God, the sweet psalmist of Israel. Beautiful uh, songs he would play. So powerful that, that for King Saul, they would shift his spirit and drive an evil spirit away. David had a passion for God, a fervor. For God, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Right before this psalm was written in 1 Samuel chapter 21, I see that his passion had shifted. It was for himself, trying to preserve what he had. Back here in Psalm 34, David's fervor comes back to God, and he says, listen, there's a personal experience. You taste it, and you'll see he is good. My wife and I, love on dates or when we travel to go to brand new restaurants. We love finding the out of the out of the way place. The one that maybe reviewed well or maybe doesn't have very good reviews, but it's a local establishment. One problem with COVID is that restaurants have been shut down, right? When we were on our honeymoon in Puerto Rico, a couple days there we just jumped in the car and began to drive to find little places that no one had ever, ever heard of before. We love that. I could tell you about the food there and the, some of the cuisine we've had over the years, and sometimes it's good, sometimes not so much, but sometimes you find something that'll say, wow, I got to go back. Wow, I want to tell everyone else, if you go to this city, you got to go to this little place. Now, you won't barely find it, all right? You'll be scared when you knock on the door, but don't worry, hold on, it's that good. 
I love steak. Why do I love steak? God said, eat it. It's good. I said, okay. I've been to some nicer steak restaurants. In fact, for our anniversary, went down to a steak restaurant uh, down in the, in the Troy area. Delicious, delicious. We had a good time as well, but the food was delicious. I could tell you about that steak at Fleming's that night, but it won't be the same until you take a bite out of it. Till they bring you that steak, and I like my steak, medium rare, airing on the side of rareness. Now, some of you are instantly turned off. You're like, what? I can't believe that. Why don't you just eat a, eat a cow raw? Is that an option? You know? Lead off with that next time. I'm okay with that. And I'm not, it's not a blatant plug for Flemings, but that night we had a great time together, and it was a great meal. And I can tell you about that steak and how it sizzled when they brought that bone in ribeye steak. It's my favorite cut of steak, a ribeye. Did a phenomenal job cooking it. The spices were great. Maybe a touch oversalted, but that's minor, all right? I won't hate on the chef too much for that. I enjoyed every bite of that, that steak that night. Delicious. And I can tell you about that steak and how, man, it felt good going down and felt good, oh, man, a few days till I ate again, two hours later. But until you take a bite, you won't really know. David says in Psalm chapter 34, verse 8, listen, take a bite for yourself. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. I've had some recommendations before for food and restaurants, and I've been disappointed before. Someone said, listen, you've got to try this. You will love this. We were dating, and uh, my wife and I, years ago, had been to maybe the first or second time I'd been to her house. Her family is German. My mother-in-law came over on a boat to Ellis Island. She may be watching this morning. I mean, German as German can be. My wife's first language was German. In fact, I had to make a rule early on in our relationship. I was driving her and her twin sister. And they made me sit in the front seat. I've been dating maybe a few months here. And they sat in the back seat while I drove them talking about me in German. And that day I made the rule, you don't talk about me in another language, you talk so I can understand what you're saying. You say, did it work, Pastor? I should have known then. <laughs> but uh, while I was there early on, uh, her mother wanted to make some delicious German dishes for me. They made this one called Huckfleisch. If you're German and you like Huckfleisch, then God bless you, you may have all of it. <laughs> Huckfleisch is steak tartare or hamburger, for those who don't know what steak tartare is. And with that, you mix in raw egg and raw onion. You then mix it, and you serve it, and you eat it on a little crusty bread. This is Huckflesh. And Germans, at least the ones that I'm familiar with, crave this dish. I grew up and was taught to uh, try everything. That's how I teach my kids. I don't mind that. So I'm looking at this dish, and they're just going to town. My wife, her sister, her mother, and her father, they're eating this like, this is the best thing. Oh, this is great. This is great. I'm sawing down those inner feelings of, okay. And so that day I said to my mother-in-law, oh, I've had this before. She just had a thrill on her face. Oh, you have? Oh, that's wonderful. I said, yes, last week I put it in a pan, fried it, and called it a hamburger. <laughs> Took a bite that day. That was my weak attempt. Humor is my go-to if I'm incredibly nervous and eating raw meat with raw egg and raw onion made me incredibly nervous. I took a bite of Huckfleisch that day. And mom, if you're watching, I don't apologize even now. Huckfleisch is not for me. <laughs> it may be for somebody. And you can tell me how good it is. I tasted it. And I was disappointed. <laughs> but there's other things I've tried. I've not been disappointed. My friend, this morning, whether you're here or online, no matter where you're at, I can tell you right now, when you taste of God, when you taste of Him, you will see, like Psalm 34, verse says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. No one who has come to God has ever been disappointed. No one who's ever tasted of his goodness has ever walked away saying, wow, that was a letdown. In fact, as you taste of the Lord and his goodness, you cannot help but want to come back for more. And David not only had his focus come back to God and his faith, but his passion, his fervor. And he said, oh, taste and see. He's good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. I was on a bad path. I wasn't doing what I was supposed to be doing, but I'm back now. I wonder this morning if in your life you feel lost a little bit. Life seems upside down. You've 
begin to internalize and dwell on fears, a problem, yourself. I wonder today if you need to refocus on him, bow to his will, accept, praise his works, promote his way. I wonder if you need to place your faith back in the one who has saved you. I wonder if you need to come back and taste God again. And you'll be reminded, if you have before, that he is good. Or maybe you're here today or online and you've never come to Jesus Christ before. We can talk about him, but my friend today, if you come to him, he will in no wise cast you out. And when you taste of the Lord, his goodness, his way, his forgiveness, you will say like David, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for what you've done in my life. Lord, help us. We're so easily sidetracked. Lord, we're so easily distanced from you because of fears that we dwell on in our mind, our heart, our soul. But Lord, may we turn our focus back to you. Lord, may we have our faith renewed and re-strengthened in you. Lord, may we have our passion restored. One who would say this morning, Pastor, as you spoke, God spoke to me. My focus maybe has been in the wrong place. My faith has been in my own solving. For Pastor, my fervor, my passion that I once had, I need to taste Lord of God again and see how good he is. I wonder who would say, Pastor, without praise hand, would you pray for me this morning as you spoke? God spoke to me. Would you pray for me this morning? Who would say, that's me this morning? Say hands, amen, amen. Hands all over. Who else? Focus needs to come back. My fervor, my faith. Amen. Who else? Amen. 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 I wonder if you're here this morning. You'd say, Pastor, I've never put my faith in Jesus Christ. I've never asked him to forgive my sins. And I don't know that I'd go to heaven. In that sense, I'm lost spiritually. When you pray for the others, would you pray for me? I don't know that I'm going to heaven, but I'd like to know, like to be sure. Would you slip your hand up and slip back down? I'd love to pray for you this morning. I'll draw no more attention to you than I did anyone else. The one who would say, that's me, Pastor. Would you pray for me when you pray for the others? Lord, you know what you're doing. Lord, help us keep our focus on you, our faith in you, and our fervor in you. Lord, those who lifted a hand, Lord, may they do business with you. And with someone here who's not saved or online, will they trust you today? Guide this invitation in Jesus' name, amen.